The Route 16 Grind, Episode 5, Chartreuse. It's a family secret. The Route 16 Grind is sponsored by Sea State Coffee, Warren Industries, Tuffy Security Products, and Route 16 Off-Road. Welcome to the Route 16 Grind, the podcast for outdoor adventurers. Each week, we bring you information related to off-road and outdoor activities. If you wheel, hunt, fish, overland, or are an all-around adventurer, this podcast is for you. Each week, we pour a cup of sea steak coffee and talk about informative topics, the gear, and the training that can help you have a successful outdoor adventure. We have amazing contributors and some great conversation. So, grab your cup and enjoy the show. Here are your hosts, Brian and Chuck. All right, welcome back to the Route 16 Grind. Chuck, so great to have you back. I was so lonely here last week. Your contribution and <laughs> conversation doing, was so missed, man. Oh, man. How was Thanksgiving? It was great. It was really good. We didn't get the pig back. Uh, so, you know, we just did the turkey and the fried turkey recipe that I shared. Uh, the last podcast, the one I did, came out uh-huh. fantastic. Um, I made some sweet potatoes, brown sugar, butter. I just What I do is I throw those in the oven for about two hours. It's nothing fancy. Roll them with tin foil twice. I already had the brown sugar and butter and smash it in. And let those things roll, and they just come out so soft and sweet. And I learned that from campfiring them. So, yeah, it was oh, yeah. good, man. Family you. was here, so it was great. Had my ne- niece down here. It was awesome. So how about that pig, though? Oh, that was- dude, it was so cool, man. <laughs> I was so proud of my son. So yeah. proud. I'm looking forward to getting after it again. How was your Thanksgiving? Oh, man, busy. Uh, real busy. We do two dinners, one with the in-laws and then one with my family. So uh, lots of food, a lot of leftovers. But I'm one of the few people, I think, that never gets tired of turkey. So, <laughs> You know, I got a 12-pound one, and that thing was destroyed within, like, two days. I mean, it was yeah. pretty much gone. So that's oh, yeah. kind of perfect for us. My my wife, she is not a big leftover person. It's like, hey, all right, we're, we're going to eat that. It's going to be gone. It's got a maybe 48 hours of life in our fridge, and it's getting thrown out. <laughs> so uh, we, we survive on leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Well, it's so good to have you back, man. Oh, appreciate it. Good to be back. We have another review, and it's from Sam F. He gave us a five out of five stars, saying, The podcast is fun to listen to, but also packed full of knowledge. I appreciate the different segments and wide range of content. We really appreciate it, Sam. Uh, Keep the reviews coming, guys. It uh, pumps up our heads a little bit, makes us feel good, keeps the content going, and kind of energizes us to keep the show rolling along. Heck yeah, Sam. We really appreciate it, brother. Uh, the, that stuff, you know, the people that host our podcast, the different you know, places that we host it at, they take monitor that and help us promote the show. So really appreciate you taking the time. And man, five out of five stars. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Want to support the show? How about becoming a Route 16 Patreon today for as little as a buck a month? It's not just a contribution, but an investment that goes directly to the show. Help this podcast to expand and grow. Benefits at each level range from a shout out during the show connected to us directly on discord receiving swag to being listed as a show producer with bonus benefits we also accept bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies check out the show notes for the links to the patreon page or our crypto cryptocurrency wallet on this episode of the route one six grind this week's outdoor update chuck shares his thoughts on a case of wildlife wildlife abuse in pennsylvania a resolution by the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, and a conservation victory from the state of Alabama. In the rock, mud, and dirt, Brian talks about Atlas 46. And in our first on-target segment, Brian interviews Ron Holmes from Riker USA, talking about his company and his invention, the Riker Grip. In the Cup of Joe segment, we discuss our upcoming In the Field segment and future guests, and much more. The Red Warren Badge says you're equipped to handle anything, ready to conquer any challenge that may come your way. That badge has stood for off-road excellence for more than 70 years. During that time, we haven't stopped innovating or striving for perfection. Be ready. Be prepared. Go Warren. The Outdoor Update is brought to you by Tuffy Security Products. Having your vehicle broken into is not a laughing matter. Trust Tuffy Security Products to stop opportunistic thieves. Tuffy is the industry leader in automotive security and provides peace of mind when you walk away from your rig. Durable and easy to install. 
Tuffy Security Products has adventure-ready consoles, drawers, and lockboxes available for you to organize your rig and secure your gear. Visit TuffyProducts.com and use special offer code GRIND to save 10% on your order. Remember to lock it up. Welcome back to the Outdoor Update, the weekly segment where we provide you with stories, news, and information from the recent going-ons in the outdoor world. The uh, first thing that I want to focus on tonight and discuss is uh, a case of wildlife abuse coming from Pennsylvania. If you've been on social media the past couple days, then I'm pretty sure you've probably seen the sickening video that's been making its rounds. It features uh, two young guys who appear to have shot and wounded a deer. And in this video, while they're laughing and carrying on, they are kicking, punching, and choking this deer. From from things that I've seen on social media, their claim is that they are trying to dispatch the deer. But that, especially to me and most folks on the internet, that doesn't hold any water because they're laughing. And they're obviously enjoying themselves. Uh, allegedly, there are other videos where they've been doing similar similar abuses to other animals and things. But um, I'm not here to kind of be judge and jury or anything i want to let everybody know that i personally think this video is disgusting no one is more angry than the hunting community these are the types of videos that us hunters and anglers and uh outdoor sportsmen we don't want out and about these guys aren't hunters PETA is calling them hunters they're not hunters they're animal abusers they're right up there with poachers they're they're not out there hunting they're out there getting their rocks off by killing things and that's not what hunting's about hunters are right there with these animal animal rights groups this is disgusting we don't want to see it we don't want to be associated with it and we're not involved in this type of behavior 99 percent. well i'll say all hunters are respectful for the most part this is not hunting and this is not what hunters represent this is not what hunters have represented Uh, This is not what hunting is. Hunting is a means to get out in the outdoors and enjoy wildlife. Hunting is a means to procure food. I can dwell on and on. This just isn't it. Recently, the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, they proposed a resolution. And before I get into the resolution, I want to get uh, give you a little bit of background about wildlife and fisheries management in North Carolina. So in North Carolina, just as in every state, there are agencies that are charged with managing the state's wildlife resources in North Carolina. That's the wildlife resources commission and their jurisdiction essentially ends in terms of management when it comes to the marine fisheries. And that is the responsibility of the division of marine fisheries, which falls under the North Carolina department of environmental quality. It's very complicated. I know. So essentially there's, All of your freshwater fish are managed by the WRC, Wildlife Resources Commission. Then there's an arbitrary line drawn. And from that point forward, there is a separate entity that's managing the marine fisheries, the DMF. Granted, there's some overlap in those joint waters, but for the most part, that's how it works out. But now to the resolution. The North Carolina Wildlife Federation has released a statement touting the consolidation of the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries into the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission to eliminate redundancy and improve and improve natural resource management efficiency. And that's actually the name of the resolution. That's the title, but it hammers the point across perfectly. And this resolution comes on the heels of numerous other bills and decisions involving the ever contentious management of North Carolina's coastal fishery, which tends to year in and year out constantly be a hot topic, both public conversation level as well as on the floor of the legislature. The resolution that was released by the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, it covers a small bit of the history of wildlife resource management in North Carolina, and it also outlines the NCWS reasoning behind the consolidation proposal. And I really encourage you to go out and read the resolution for yourself. But I'm going to read a few excerpts that I think stick out to me and that kind of summarize the issues that we're facing here in North Carolina. Whereas historically, in a time of exceptional abundance of marine fishery stocks, the management of marine fisheries was set aside to to a separate agency, 
originally called the Office of Commercial Fisheries, to allocate harvest at a maximum at maximum levels for commercial purposes, with little regard for protecting breeding stocks to replenish future fisheries. And whereas the missions of the WRC and the DMF to protect and enhance the public trust natural resources and habitats of North Carolina are closely aligned, but create areas of duplication, redundancy, uncertainty, and inefficiency, as indicated by the partial list presented here. Artificial, arbitrary, and burdensome designation of coastal, joint, and inland waters. Separate law enforcement divisions to enforce the rules for each type of fishing waters, which, in effect, mandate that the same fishes swimming back and forth have different protections depending upon where they may be at any given time. Separate administrative functions for each agency, including purchasing, printing, personal manage- personnel management, license sales, and record keeping, and separate governances by extensive boards of commission, which represents a large commitment of resources with no identifiable benefit other than political patronage, especially with regards to the MFC and the archaic gubernatorial criteria of member appointments based on the economic segment of the industry they represent. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the North Carolina Wildlife Federation in official session this 16th day of November 19th that for reasons given herein, the consolidation of the MSC and DMF into the WRC would result in more effective, a more effective agency to manage and administer the fish, wildlife, and marine fisheries resources of North Carolina. So that's kind of the summary you can take away from the resolution. This is one of those things, and and I know I'm kind of heavy on North Carolina topics at times, but this is one of those things that perfectly sums up my public lands and my conservation story and the why I do what I do. I've spent a lot of time at Cape Lookout National Seashore on the coast of North Carolina, and I spent time there with my family, being my grandfather and my uncle, and we enjoy catching flounder. And right now, I'm not allowed to catch or keep or I'm allowed to catch flounder, but I can't keep any flounder due to a government imposed shutdown, which I'm, I'm totally fine with if that's, what's going to bring the flounder back, but just punishing, um, recreational fishermen and commercial flounder fishermen without doing any real management to get, to evaluate and to remove other means of take that are negatively impacting the coastal fisheries whether it be economic or political purposes is, is just it's it should be criminal but it's not but that's just kind of why i point this out uh this is a topic that i could go on about for hours this is a very deep topic um and if this is something that interests you i, I highly encourage you to get online do some research for yourself the department of environmental quality website's a perfect place to start uh, and then you can proceed there and get further into the Division of Marine Fisheries and check out the CCA as well as the North Carolina Wildlife Federation website to get a little bit more information. And now for a conservation success story out of Alabama. For the first time since 1916, there was a sandhill crane that was harvested in Alabama. This was, took place yesterday. And this story was pointed out to me by my buddy Dustin, who is of Episode 2 and Route 1 Six Instagram fame. And the little background about the sandhill crane, it's a, it's a large game bird and it's made up of six subspecies, three of which are migratory and three are non-migratory. And the migratory subspecies are a game bird that spends, that spends the spring and summer spread out across Canada, Alaska, and the upper Midwest of the United States before it begins a migration down to the wintering grounds in the southern U.S. and northern Mexico. The greater sandhill crane is the predominant species that was found in Alabama. And like many bird species in North America, habitat is vital to their future. And the sandhill cranes, depending on their location, use various types of habitats depending upon their needs at the time. But they're particularly reliant on marshes and wetlands. And so thanks in part to the direct and indirect efforts of many conservation organizations, government agencies, and monies generated through hunting license sales, the Sand Hill crane population has seen significant growth over the past 50 to 60 years and has also seen stabilization across much of their range. If you're interested in more information about the Sand Hill Crane, I encourage you to visit the websites of the Audubon Society, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, or your local wildlife management agency.
Man, Chuck, that was a, a lot. Definitely missed you last week. First part with uh, the I saw that video, man. It just I didn't even play it all. To be honest with you, I watched uh, ten seconds of each one. It, it just it just made me cringe, and yep. you just know the domino effect of uh, what was going to come out. The, the cop out isn't, hey, I'm young, I didn't know any better. These were what I, I, I understand is licensed hunters, and obviously that you know you go through that course and specifically talk about being humane. And the wrong and 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 what right and wrong dispatch is, et cetera, et cetera. So, I, I'm not going for that. And then the uh, the flounder. Oh man, yeah. I felt that when I went. I actually took my son and his friend fishing earlier this year, and that was one of the things that came out. I didn't I didn't know about that at the time, and it, it's like, what yep. do you mean we can't grab any of those? And yeah, I think it's a good point where you talked about the the merging of that stuff of of those organizations. Me, I mean, hey, I I like less government, but Again, uh, what they're doing, I think it's more, it just seems more like a power thing. And we could probably talk about that a little bit later. Well, on to the less government thing. Essentially, this is less government because you're yeah. merging two people that should allegedly have the same interest in mind. And so, I mean, there's just so much overlap. And just economically, it doesn't make sense, let alone from a wildlife management standpoint. So, yeah, if you're, if I'm with you, if I'm giving you my tax dollars, I want you to spend them as effectively as possible. Absolutely. You know, you're already so, stealing from us, <laughs> but yeah. Hey, yeah, the- no, man, I totally get it. But the, the whole thing with the flounder and I know I, I, when I start, I start talking about it going on and on and I really didn't intend to bring up the flounder. I just wanted to point out this resolution and have folks look into it, but it really is something that's super important to me. And it's, it, there's so many layers to why it's important to me. And there's so many uh, layers why, flounder spot and croakers and your weak fishes and things like that are disappearing across the coast and it boils down to inefficient management right. certain segments of the population are being catered to when others aren't right so. yeah i can i you know what I, there's there's plenty of references uh just looking at you know the deer management if you just take a page out of you know the qma uh, playbook and you apply it to whatever like better term your spirit animal is you you can do have some great success there and right. I, I think you're right. Oh, it yes. just the attention is sometimes favored for one versus the other versus hey, let's just favor the environment in that area and bring these animals back. Right. So what about right. that? Well, sand it's hill? just like with the sandhill crane. Yeah, I don't even know what that looks like. I'm told we're going to put that in the show show notes. I don't know about anybody else. I absolutely have never even heard of a sandhill crane. Uh, but it, when you brought broke out the whole it's three of this and three of that, I'm like, holy cow, man. <laughs> Well, it's a, it's a, it's a crane. I mean, uh-huh. everybody kind of knows what cranes look like. It's right. a big long, long-legged bird with a long beak. And this one's no different. It just happens to be a very delicious bird. Right. That people hunted. And from from what I've gathered and a little bit of research I've done on it over, I mean, this is a bird that I've been aware of for several years now. It doesn't appear that they ever were like listed as endangered species, but hunting wasn't allowed from like in the United States from like 1908, I think like 1940, like zero hunting of the Sandhill crane. Wow. And slowly over time it's been built back up. Uh huh. And so there's no, like you've got the Rocky mountain elk foundation. There's no national Sandhill crane foundation right. or anything like that. There are societies and, and particularly like with the Audubon society and there's a Sandhill crane society or the crane society, I should say that, that cares about these birds as an entire species. But realistically, this is one of those birds that benefited from the efforts of like DU and from the Audubon society and from the U S fish and wildlife service. And just in general, from habitat management and habitat protection through just conservation dollars generated through license sales. So you have Um, public involvement, uh, assisting government. And that's a great thing. It's a great thing. yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I encourage people to check out videos of the migration when they come through Nebraska. It literally, it, it's amazing. Nebraska is like this big hub. Essentially, a big chunk of these birds coming down from Canada funnel together and they get together in Nebraska to get along. I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but there's a river there that they congregate on in the sand hills in Nebraska. And it is amazing the number of animals that are there at once. That's pretty crazy. I'm going to have to find a video, put that in the show notes. I'm going to do that. Thanks a lot, Chuck. Really appreciate that, man. Great to have you back. We'd like to feature your successes and outdoor adventures. So shoot the pics over to us with a brief story, route16.com and select contact. That's R O O T 
O-N-E-S-I-X.com and select contact. Want to be on the show? Maybe share with us some interesting hunting, fishing, overlanding, wheeling, or adventuring news? Then give us a call at the Route 16 hotline at 919-694-3356. And maybe you can be on our next show. Since 1989, Tuffy Security Products has been the industry leader in automotive security. Tuffy has a variety of vehicle-specific consoles, drawers, and lock boxes. Tuffy manufacturers adventure-ready organization and security for your Jeep, truck, or SUV. Visit TuffyProducts.com and use special offer code GRIND to save 10% on your order. In the Rock, Mud and Dirt is brought to you by Warren Industries. At Warren, we pour our effort and our thirst for adventure into every product we make. You better believe American pride runs deep here in Clackamas, Oregon. Here, a small army of engineers, technicians, machinists, and assemblers design and refine Warren products, bringing them as close to perfection as possible. Their work is backed up by legendary quality control that doesn't just stand up to rigid worn standards. It lives up to the toughest demands of the world's top vehicle manufacturers and military suppliers. How do we know? Because they've partnered with Warren for decades. This quest for peerless reliability, this worn difference, will be around as long as Warren Industries is in business. At least another 70 years. Go prepared. Go worn. Welcome to The Rock, Mud, and Dirt. I swear I change that up every week. I think I got it right this week. So welcome back. We're going to talk about Atlas 46. So this is a segment we'll talk about off-road brands, people, and events. This week I'm going to talk about a pretty cool store solution. For some of us, winter is coming, but for others, winter is here. Regardless where you fit in the weather sphere, when there is snow and ice, the recovery gear becomes the norm in your rig. Items like the kinetic energy lines, recovery lines, snatch blocks, metal and nylon shackles, shorty straps, tree savers, specialty shackles, and more are items you might want to carry with you. Off-roaders and 4x4 owners are known to help each other out and fellow citizens who might slide off the road due to icy conditions or get stuck in the snow in a snow pile. The recovery gear is not only for self-assist, but for requested neighbor assist as well. Depending how much gear you feel you need, it should not only be organized and accessible, but it should be secured. As this gear will have a little weight to it, you might want to use an old, you can use an old pack or a bag to store these items in. And yeah, that might work. But if you're looking for a bag that could be an improvement, I recommend what I use for root, a recovery bag. And that is the Atlas 46 Canyons Truck Cargo Bag. Being 24 inches wide, 13 and a quarter inches deep, and 8 inches high, this bag can organize anything from recovery gears to tools. With four removable attachment points to secure in the vehicle, these come in real handy ensuring the bag is secured in place as you crawl, climb, articulate, and flex. And if you do roll, that 50 plus pounds of gear isn't flying around loose or becoming a giant rock waiting to land on you. It has over 2,500 cubic inches inches of storage space, hard shell inserts with foam padding to make its shape, reinforced carry handles with exterior AIMS attachment slots allows you to completely customize this bag. The Canyon's truck cargo bag made of durable 100D Cordura nylon, handcrafted in the United States with a lifetime guarantee. These bags are available in coyote, black, chartreuse, which is like a green tint, and orange. I have used this bag for almost a year and it's pretty much is always in my rig. I can just get out what I need and use it and then return it back in the bag or I can disconnect the attachment straps with these and carry the bag with all the gear to a point that I and the gear can be staged and be utilized. If you look at my recovery gear, you know I use it. If you looked at my Canyon truck cargo bag, you would think I just got it last week. With all the moving, dirt, dragging, and gear shifting, the bag still looks new. So go to atlas46.com today. Get yourself one of these awesome Canyons truck cargo bags. It was, it was made for the off-road rig in mind. And while you're there, make sure to look at all the great storage bags, construction, construction vests, mechanics setup, tool organizers, and even pants and shorts. All the products are made in America by this creative and talented small business. There is not one thing that Atlas 46 makes that I do not want. Their gear is just that good. It's Route 16 approved. Chartreuse. Yeah, I, I hope I said that right. Someone might correct you, me. You did. <laughs> I'm going to point out why I know. Oh, We're going to go back to the outdoor update. For all you folks interested in doing some fishing this spring, and if you want to catch some crappy, put chartreuse jigs on your hook. Man, I did not know that. I actually had to look it up. I was like, man, what color is that? It's kind of like that. I think it's what the kind of like that camo green that you see on uh, that camo I'll pattern say now. It is, when people ask me what color is chartreuse, I say it's green as hell. 
Really? Yeah, I was going to say lime, but it just seemed like it was too much. But yeah, I, okay, there yeah, you go. It yeah, is, it is green. Yeah, awesome. But, uh, legitimately, like that is well, it is the best color. But my grandpa would not fish with anything else except chartreuse or chartreuse and black jigs for crappy. So when you said it, I was like, uh, Brian hasn't crappy fished much. <laughs> So true. So true. Yeah. This, I tell you what, this company, I love them so much. They make some real good quality gear. I mean, you go to atlas46.com, you'll know exactly what I'm saying. And I mean it. There's not one thing that they make. I do not want. I absolutely have a purpose for everything that they make. It is amazing. So if you need a storage solution or you just need something to carry gear, store gear, wherever, you know, vehicle on your body, whatever the case, they got it. And on top of it, if you have an idea, just tell them they will work with you and they might have something already on the blueprint. Really good gear. I have a variety of their products. Yorktown tool roll, uh, tool roll is one of them. It's great stuff. So yeah, oh, char- chartreuse. Dude, and I'm, I'm a bag junkie. <laughs> like when I checked out their stuff, I was like, well, how can I use this deer hunting? But legit, like you said, it's not just for off-roading though. No. Their, their gear would be perfect if you're, if you're into the HVAC or any type of service technician. I mean, it's a legit, easy to carry tool bag. Yes. Yeah, they have some great gear and they have like little access straps. I mean, you can absolutely customize it too. That's a great thing too. The magnet bands, every, I mean, it's just amazing stuff. I can probably talk about it all night, but we probably got to move on, Chuck. Have an idea or maybe you would like to contribute to one of our segments? Then go to root16.com and select contact and let us know your idea. That's Route16, R-O-O-T-O-N-E-S-I-X dot com and select contact. Imagine walking back to your vehicle in the parking lot and seeing glass on the ground with your door wide open. Your stomach drops and your world is turned upside down. Don't become a victim of opportunistic thieves. Be proactive and install a Tuffy. Since 1989... Tuffy Security Products has been the key to locking it up. Tuffy has adventure-ready consoles, drawers, and lockboxes available for your rig. With universal and vehicle-specific options, has something for what you drive. Organize your rig and secure your gear by visiting TuffyProducts.com today. And special offer code GRIND to save 10% on your order. That's G-R-I-N-D in the special offer code box when you go to checkout at TuffyProducts.com. I'm Target. All right. Welcome to our first segment with On Target. I have Ron Holmes, Director of Training and Product Development with Riker. You might know them from the Riker Grip. Ron, thank you so much for jumping in here. Really appreciate it, Heck brother. Yeah, man. This is uh, it's exciting. I'm glad to see uh, you're living beyond uh, the confines of what the general consensus of what military dudes have to do after they retire and uh, you're being creative and i'm glad to be part of this heck yeah same here so ron and i go way back some things we'll share some things we won't (laughs) (laughs) but yeah we go way back ron and i both served in the marine corps we met when we were both going to one of our training schools both served in the uh, marine recon and force recon communities and ron comes with a plethora of experience and background so you know, what, what led to, so for those of you who don't know what the Riker Grip, Ron's going to talk about it, but what led to the creation of the Riker Grip? So much probably like you and a bunch of other guys who, you know, you know from our arena in the military uh, did not get out um, without some type of, you know, trauma impact or an injury to the body. Um, I retired from MARSOC in 2010 and then went into government service where I was still carrying a gun uh, for, for my job. And what I had found is, is, uh, my support arm was painfully going numb with traditional products that were on the market and just other different types of ways to, to, uh, hold in and engage and, you know, accurately shoot the rifle. Um, I think I really first started known, noticing this is when I was heavy into competitive shooting and, uh, it was just um, super uncomfortable, and I found myself coming back to an inferior grip, bringing my support hand back to the magwell just for pain management. So I kind of had a conversation with myself, and it's like, I've got to figure something out that's going to allow me to do my job and not put people's lives at jeopardy. 
just because of the inferior grip. And so I started uh, hacking up, cutting, melting, uh, screwing together all any grip that I had, trying to find something that I that I just kind of wanted to to give me the advantage to shoot my AR pain free. And uh, I actually uh, I'm sitting here right next to the box of all the prototypes from the very first one to uh, the last ones right before we released um, just over two years ago. And uh, yeah, I remember you showing one of those in Vegas when we went to Shot Show. I mean, it's phenomenal where it's at right now to where that raw material was at that point yeah yeah and it's been a it's the and i like to call it the journey because we're still on it and there's so many things we've learned uh uh, you know along the way but initially the Riker grip was invented for uh just solely for pain management you know for me and i guess the best i I gotta give the story of prior to retiring i had bilateral shoulder and elbow surgeries so i have rubber bands that hold my shoulders in and i've got screws that hold my elbows and uh, and the tendons on my elbows in, you know into my bones um so all that combined with multiple compressions in my spine led to part of the reason why my support arm would go numb um and uh so that's that's where the, the i guess that's where the the invention came from was out of the necessity dealing with existing injuries. So, you know, the, the, the big thing that's out there folks is so generally what you'll see is like the broom handles, you know, the broomstick. You'll see that at the forward upper receiver of a rail system on a AR 15 or something similar of that platform. And you hold that instead of the magwell or instead of just gripping around the upper receiver there, and Ron came up with this invention. I don't, I don't think people understand Ron sometimes that the, you know, you do get tired with that weapon being up and in doing multiple engagements. And for those of you who may not have, you know, been in competitive shooting or, you know, have gone done some aggressive training with rifles or carbines specifically, um, it can be, it could be a, a lot of fatigue out there uh, when you're working with this. And Ron has brought a different perspective uh, with the Riker grip. So who is using the Riker grip? From prototype through production, we have over four years on the ground in combat in five countries. And, you know, my two partners are, uh, one's retired Navy, one is actually still in a Navy reserve. And what we have done is we've, you know, exercised our friends and family network trying to help us with the prototyping of this. So we've had guys in, in all of the uh, special operations uh, branches of the military to conventional infantry units and to some uh, quite a few government agencies that have been using uh, using the Riker grip to, uh, from prototype through production. That is uh, awesome. So, yeah, that's awesome, man. So, yeah, and then uh, I, you know, and I always I always have to to add this in is that um, our first uh, our first sponsored shooter is is eleven year old Alpha Addy. So if you guys uh, uh, should really go to Instagram and look up Alpha Addy, she's 11 year old. She's uh, lives in San Antonio, Texas, and she's a competitive shooter and she runs a Riker grip. And then our second sponsor shooter was Pineapple Shooter, Reagan, whose um, Instagram is Pineapple Shooter, and she's down in Florida. Uh, and both of them um, use the Riker grip to help propel them and um, uh, help get them, you know, a little bit further ahead. Uh, in their in their shooting careers so they're now uh, 11 and 13 years old and they're paid to shoot so that's pretty awesome that is really awesome i remember you uh, you posting some stuff on there and uh you know texas rest can recognize i like that so yeah. uh you know is that brings in you know you bring in competitive shooting you know specifically like three gun it's not just a, a single platform is is a Riker grip just for the ar or does it work for other rifles no Great question. So when I made this, like I said, uh, is is um, uh, I made it for pain management so I could shoot my AR and that was it. I was thinking one dimensional. I wasn't thinking anything beyond shooting my AR pain free. And once we got into the, uh, the, the first phase of prototyping with the 3D printed versions of the Riker grip, we were on the range one day and we're like, let's put it on a shotgun. And we did, and we're like, "Oh my god, this is amazing!" Like, dude, let's put it on a three hundred eight. Let's put <laughs> let's put it on everything. And then we're calling all our boys, and you know, in in the previous you know commands that we were, and we're like, "Hey man, I got something I need you to try on a stall." 
And so at this point, what we started to find out is, is we were really on to something that it's now the, we, we like to say is that the heavier the gun, the higher the caliber and or full auto, you will recognize the benefit of the Riker grip and the Riker method instantly. And, uh, that led us to pursuing it and, and, and just, it's, it's extremely versatile. And, um, when we started putting it on other guns, we started realizing that we also felt faster and you could do the eye test and you could see that your targets and your accuracy was actually getting tighter. So we wanted to think about like, Hey, how can we prove this? How can we say we're faster with this? How can we say our accuracy is improved? And how can we say that this is a superior grip out there? So what, what ended up happening is we actually, uh, and made our team a little bigger. So we have a team of PhD statisticians that helped us validate a 96 round course of fire that measures speed and accuracy. And we can prove that you are faster with the grip and accuracy is maintained or improved. Um, I, it, 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 it's a, it's a random, you flip a coin, heads is with grip, tails is without grip. Uh, it's three targets, uh, to center, to left, to right, to center, to right, to left. And you'd run that again with grip, without grip. That's your first relay. That's your warm up, And then you run it three more times. And that's how we record the time. So the last time we ran this at the beginning of the summer, I had two Marine Raiders, one of them who had never seen the grip. And the other one had multiple deployments with the grip. I had a force recon Marine, a Marine uh, scout sniper. Both of those guys had not shot in the grip yet. And I had a, a Green Beret who has multiple deployments and he helped us. He was instrumental in our uh, prototype phase. And those five, those five high caliber shooters ran them through that 96 round course of fire. When we added all the data up, it was 5% increase in speed. There was 11 misses and those were all when they were not using the grip. So they had no misses and a 5% increase in speed. They said that the reason that they had the misses is that they were trying, they were, they were over penetrating uh, or overshooting their target because they were trying to replicate the feel and natural body alignment that the grip gives you transitioning from target to target. 5% and you know, like from what we used to do, 5%, that's, that's eternity in a gunfight. Right. Fight. Absolutely. You know, so, so that, that there's, there's, there's so many different things. And the thing is too, is that both of the rifles, they were identical. The only, the only thing that was different was one was, had a grip on it and the other one did not, but they were the same exact AR all, all the way, you know, all the way down. Um, and that's how we, we run that test randomly from time to time, you know, so in this journey, we've also found like, you know, the, the tactical industry, I guess the politest I can say this is it has no shortage of experts um, and seems like everybody on the internet was in special operations uh, at some point in their life. I got Velcro. And they, they, I qualify. Yeah. And they're all about letting you know how, um, how much they know and how much you don't know and how stupid you are. And um, so we knew we were going to be um, uh, forcefully introduced to these types of people and we wanted to do something different. So if you think about all of the accessories and all the equipment that you've ever been issued uh, for firearms, you know, in, in your career, how many of them actually have involved science and medical, uh, you know, medical professionals to help develop that product? And the answer is, is probably none. We brought in a, a PhD biomechanics specialist, an ophthalmologist, the statisticians. The engineers, and we ended up with two SOCOM uh, MDs who helped us with the development of this project. And uh, the biomechanic guy told us, it's funny, is when we, we sat down with him, he told us that we were wasting our time making this for rifles. He oh, said, wow. uh, Yeah, he said, you're, ma- you're wasting your time. He goes, he goes, you guys need to be marketing this to impact tools and power tools. This needs to be on every single power tool on the market right now. And, uh, so that is, that is something that we, we will get to. Um, but right now we're, we're not heeding his advice and we're staying with, with the, uh, shoulder fire weapon platforms. <laughs> right. You co- you covered a lot of ground there. Definitely. You know, from what I'm capturing here, the intent 
initially might have been for ARs, but you've grown way past that with just the inventory you share with us from semi-automatic, uh, fully automatic weapons. And you're, you're talking about light machine gun, uh, large rifle, small rifle. I mean, whole plethora of thing. And then you also, like, like I like the fact that you, you're bringing out, hey, you took a scientific approach, but you also had a medical approach with it. Uh, a lot of people that this is targeting, uh, they're going to have some type of sports injury, some type of on-the-job injury, et cetera. Um, what about some more detail with that? Like, how does this really help those people, you know, specifically not just with your injuries, but maybe other ones that you've uh, come and encountered out there where uh, a shooter has said, hey, man, this has helped me out tremendously. And they're able to, one, continue to employ the weapon how they need to, but they're also to uh, able to enjoy the activities. Maybe they are a competitive shooter or they go out and do uh, different styles of hunting or whatever. Uh, what are some other things that this benefits from a medical standpoint? So that's one of the things when we brought the medical team on, we are, are actually doing a medical study right now in the background as we're doing all this. And we want to actually get the Riker grip listed as a medical device. And when these doctors told us that they, that's what they wanted to do for us. We, our first question was like, yeah, it sounds kind of cool, but can we do that? They're like, we just did it for the titanium hammer. And I was like, so what does that mean? They're like, if you're a general contractor, if you're a contractor and you swing a hammer for a living, you can go to your doctor and they can write you a prescription for a titanium hammer. Oh, wow. Whoa. Wow. And so the goal, I think I need one. Was, huh? I think I might need one. <laughs> so the goal is going to be to get the Riker grip listed as a medical device so law enforcement can go and have their doctor write a prescription for it. And then it's covered under their insurance. Right. Right. As similar as a back brace as a knee brace and stuff like that. So that's still, that's still, you know, that's probably still like a 2000 meter target, you know, in in the picture here, but it is being worked in the background. So who, 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 what are benefits of this? Well, it's existing injuries. Like what I have, if you have neck compressions, if you have arthritis, if you have joint issues, you have mobility issues, uh, this, this won't aggravate them. If you guys want to take the time, you can go, uh, go to, um, the truth about guns.com and Google John Wayne Taylor. And he did an article about two years ago on the Riker grip. And one of the things he talks in there is about the lack of fatigue that he experienced when remaining on target and the lack of pain in his, in his, uh, his forward support hand. So we've also been contacted by, I've gotten quite a few letters and, you know, somebody had asked us, you know, once before, like, Hey, what, you know, what's success, you know? Well, this was an idea that was in my head and it's now full patent, not patent pending. We have a full patent on this. Right. Right. You know, and, and so I think that's pretty successful. Uh, but I, I think when I actually got to take. Kyle Carpenter, who I tell you, if if you ever have the opportunity to meet this kid, and I call him a kid because he is, he is one of the most beautiful people I've ever met in my life. And um, and if you're not familiar with who Kyle Carpenter is, you need to go and um, you, you need to go to your Google machine and look him up. But he is a Medal of Honor recipient. He jumped on a grenade to save the lives of his of his brother Marines. I believe he died 13 times. And he just kept coming back. And he is the most positive person like I've ever met. So from his injuries that he sustained, he hasn't been able to shoot because of the his wrist is in a fixed position because of the nerve damage uh, that he sustained. And you put a rifle in his hands with the Riker grip. And his exact words were the first time he shot it, he shot a full mag. He turned around and looked at us. And he's like, gentlemen, that was sexual. And <laughs> And then he says, can I shoot some more? And we put it, you know, we hooked him up, chest rig. He was changing mags and everything. And he, he came right back and he goes, right now, as I am today, I could go back to Afghanistan with this grip. That's awesome. That we've is had, awesome. We had this one guy hit us up and he's like, hey, man, I want you all to know you made a great product. He's like, uh, I went hog hunting from a helicopter. He goes, I crushed six hogs. I swear in like, you know, five seconds. Everybody's like, holy cow, what did you do? And he goes, now I've gone hog hunting a lot. He goes, I've never been able to shoot as fast and accurate until I used your grip. 
and uh, and I were and I'm you're going on your reading, and he goes, I think this is a good time to mention that I don't have any leg. I'm a dual amputee, and he goes, it's extremely hard for me to get find a you know a good balance point when trying to shoot. He goes, your grip solves all of that. We had a guy hit us up who's like, I was a double lung transplant, retired cop, competitive shooter. And he's like, I can no longer, I could no longer shoot because my, my chest just isn't strong enough to hold a rifle up until I had your grip. Just by placing the rifle, moving their hand from underneath the rifle out to the side, it opens up the chest cavity, it opens you up. So it takes, so you're not using individual muscles. You're not crushing yourself down. You're, you're in a more athletic, more dynamic stance. So success, we gave people back something that they lost. Right. And, and so when I talked about before one dimensional, I was thinking one dimensional, like when you get hit with these emails and, and these stories of these people and sitting there realizing like it never was even, it never even crossed our minds that we were going to actually change people's lives on that aspect. We were thinking more of putting a tool into, you know, our warriors, our, our service members and our first responders, putting a tool in their hand that's going to allow them to do their job better. And along the way, we found all these other amazing, amazing things on this journey. So what is success? I think we've hit it. We've hit, we feel, we all feel as a company, we've reached success. If we never sold another grip beyond today, we, we are confident in what we've done because we have helped change lives. It, so to speak. Yeah, that's humbling, Ron. And just, uh, you know, for someone to just tell you their experience while hunting, you know, shooting from a helicopter nonchalantly through, oh, yeah, I, I don't have legs. And a perspective that you're getting that you wouldn't know unless this information comes back at you. And it's just amazing. And it, it's been amazing as uh, being a fan uh, of Riker itself, as far as myself and watching it progress and from where, where it was to where it is now. I'm a fan of the grip. I told you that the first time I think I grabbed it. Um, I love it. And I'm looking forward to setting up my shotgun to shoot from what we discussed before. But really, you know, what's the next modification generation? You're not just stopping where you're at right now, are you? No, no. So this, the version that's out now is, is version one. It is, uh, it's 3.25 ounces. It's extremely light. It's made out of the same industry standard, um, like a uh, glass, glass infused, fiberglass infused polymer that all the other accessories are made out of. It's manufactured in the United States, has to be to be sold to DOD. Um, and this was this was just the one to get it out there. Our ultimate goal is what we're going to we want to make is what we call the joystick of the weapon. We want to have integrated controls on this. So and we're going to have a few options for this. So you'll have a single button so your your internal wiring you won't need pressure pads anymore your uh whether it be a thumb actuator or a uh index finger actuator you will be able to turn light laser on with the press of a button on the grip um wiring will be internal and it'll just come out the side whichever side you have it on uh if you're left or right handed shooter and you just plug it into your device and use it and we're all we're working up towards you know we're, we're working it, with uh, potentially a couple companies right now, and again, nothing's fast in this. When you're taking something that didn't exist and you're taking it to market, and then you're actually explaining it, and I don't want to say making people believers, but seeing the benefit, uh, right. the long term benefit, and and then the vision of it. So we're we're talking with some companies that are much large larger than us to help get us to that next point. Where now we're do, we're talking about with the higher end military versions, where these guys are going to be able to cycle through their you know their nods. They're going to be able to uh, control multiple radios and, and and stuff like that. So essentially, making it the joystick of the weapon. So you know, and then if you think now, like if you look back now, like the kids joining the military now, like they all play Xbox and PlayStation. They're all they're all playing some type of video game. So adding some controls, some buttons onto a Riker grip is going to be very common for them, just similar to them playing their Xbox. What about, uh, uh, you know, doing a little bit of Morse code with that? You know, Ron and I were both communicators in Recon, so, you know, what about a little dit-da-dit, man? Is that going to be in there? 
You know, I mean, well, you, th- that's too easy. If you're if you're hooked up on the radio and you can't talk, you know, boom, 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 you could you could just press, you know, press that PTT and and send it that way. That's what I'm talking about. You know, upgrades. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, you know, so-, so that, and that's the other thing too is is if you look and you watch all these movies and these shows and and if you think about it, and if you've ever been, you know, a gunfighter. And you're sitting there and you're on target and you have to take your support arm off to come back and hit your PTT right. to talk and then go back. And if you're trying to laze and talk and all this, you know that. And and here's the thing. We talked about that fatigue factor. So if you're on a long movement, you've been out for like six, seven hours and you're trying to stay up on target. Though, that gun is going to be heavy, even with the sling and all of the stuff that is on it is right. just making it heavier. You know, so that so that's another benefit of the grip is traditional methods have you under your grip and posture coming from underneath the gun. So what that does is that's forcing you to hold the weight of the gun up. And right. because you're holding the weight of the gun up, there's a few things that are going wrong here. One, you're isolating pretty much all that weight on your front delt of your support shoulder. That's what's going to induce fatigue. That's what's going to get you to shake. That's what's going to make the hand go numb. Because you're reaching across your body, and if you're wearing kit, you know, play carrier, uh, backpack, rucksack, and all that, that's going to start re- restricting that blood flow into that uh, into that support arm. These are all things that are going to start bringing on fatigue. Right, right, right. Start getting that numbness and stuff. And you know, I yep. you you hit on a point too. I, I think one of the the biggest things that you deal with is some people don't want changes. I mean. We went through that through our own journey in the Marine Corps as, you know, equipment change or those modifications. There are things just based off of your own personal experience. It wasn't an easy transition because you just didn't know any better. And I think that's one of the things. It's knowledge and just experience for that change. And this is something that is totally different out of the box, um, you know, and that brings out those type of challenges. I mean, what are some other big challenges that you all have have uh, come into with with this journey here? Ah, oh, dude, the biggest one is we actually got into the wrong market. Uh, I, I, and I'm, I'm That's so funny that, you share that. <laughs> I'm saying that with a little bit of humor, but the tactical industry is the hardest industry to navigate right now. Right. Uh, it, with the landscape of our country and social media is, is controlled by a very, very left um, anti-gun rhetoric. It makes it very hard for us to expand our reach as a service-disabled veteran-owned small business. And the, so one of the, the biggest challenges we have is, is marketing and reach and being able to, you know, live within, you know, within our, our operating capital and make product and work on future stuff and get out there. So getting, getting the word out across, you know, and, and around the world. It's been a, it's been a challenge. Um, we didn't know until we had started. You can't do paid advertising for anything firearms related on Facebook, Instagram, oh, yeah. Google, yep. YouTube, mm-hmm. and it's only gotten and it's only gotten worse. To the, it's gotten worse to where they're now doing all these algorithm stuff. They're shadow banning firearms companies. They're they're restricting your growth of your feed. Um, so you, you know, you just keep chugging away and then hopes that like, you know, I'm, I like to say it's one, it's a long hashtag that we use on Instagram, but changing the world one grip at a time. And that's, that's, that's really where we're at. You know, I'm I'm going to change the world one grip at a time. You know, (laughs) I, I do want to see this on every Marines rifle, obviously, because we're Marines and I, I think that there's benefit in there, you know? Um, so that, I think honestly, our biggest challenge has been, has been marketing, uh, marketing the product and getting it, getting it out there, uh, because you know, you can't, and everything is done through social media. So we're getting there. Um, we're, we're getting there, but, uh, uh, just because it's difficult, doesn't mean we're just like, Oh, we're, you know, we're going to tuck tail and go home. No, we're just, we just keep, keep trying harder, keep fighting harder. You know, you're, you're so productive too. And for people that don't know Ron, uh, also known as instructor one, let me tell you, this guy every day is posting out good information and content, uh, from his social media platform. He's out there doing some other things. If you go to shot show, he's going to be out there. Riker will be out there. 
they they're they're in uh, the know with a lot of great companies and just a top notch team. I, I I tell you, this is not one of those you know Velcro Commando companies, and you know everybody's gonna just tell you about all their awesome experiences from that one time you know back when and stuff. I mean, these guys have definitely put the legwork into this product, and they understand the goal for their end users. And, and I think it's one thing, it's just the feedback from, you know, all the different, you know, disabled vet or disabled individuals who have been able to get reignited into, you know, taking on that hobby that, or something they enjoyed again because of this grip, you know, what's, what's for you all, what's the goal, the long-term vision for this company? Uh, like, you know, like I said, I want it on every Marine soldier, sailor's rifle. I want it on every cruiser weapon. I want it to be on every, single i want every police officer in the united states to have the the ability to uh be able to go into their their armory and say like yeah hey throw a riker grip on there uh that's you know that's what we want i want to be able to have this so we do have multiple versions of the joystick uh you know the joystick version of the grip with single button laser single button light light laser calm you know just being able to provide the, the the user the ability to operate more effectively um and, and, you know, and you, you, you touched on this. So we've also found like our demographic is the younger kids who are coming into the military and in law enforcement really adapt to it really well. And the middle, the middle age guys that are the middle, like I would say 27 to about 38, they're kind of stuck in their ways. And what you're finding is these guys over 40 are, that's our huge, our big demographic is the guys over 40 because they're actually realizing the benefits for existing injuries that's not aggravating. Um, but, uh, you know, fatigue is eliminated, recoil is eliminated, and we really just want to get that message out there. Speed, accuracy, and stability are all improved. Uh, because you're putting your hand out to the side, you're pulling it back into your shoulder. That means you're not isolating an individual muscle group you're using your back, your shoulders, your chest. This eliminates fatigue because you're pulling it back this is going to be the, the key factor in eliminating recoil, keeping that muzzle down for those faster follow-up shots. Now, there's another big factor. You know, when you go three mags deep and you're into that fourth mag, that gun has got heat coming off it. Even with a glove, that gun is hot enough where you're not really thinking about marksmanship. You're thinking about pain management of dealing of mitigating that heat. Our grip 100% removes you from the heat. No, no glove, no heat. Um... So the whole reason, another another part talking about like um, body mechanics, the whole reason why people do that thumb over or that C grip, we give you all the advantages of why you do that and we remove all the disadvantages. Uh, another common commonality of movement, you we don't teacup pistols, so why would we teacup a rifle? Right. We, te- we, we shoot pistols in an athletic, dynamic stance. So why do we shoot our rifle in a different position? The Riker grip gives you the ability now to shoot every shoulder fire rifle that you have the same exact body position as when you shoot a pistol. So you have commonality of movement, and that inherently makes you faster. Yeah, it, it feels very natural. I remember the first time that actually well, I, I, I bought one when you guys first got them out, and uh, I was like, oh, yeah, this this thing, uh, it's very natural. If you can raise your arm, you, you got it. And it, I agree with the whole just the lack of fatigue. Yeah, it's a great piece of gear. As uh, far as the Riker grip, it, it's not the only thing you do. You, do. You guys offer like training and what about you? Do you sell other equipment as well? Not yet. Not yet. We're working on some other things, uh, some other products. And, and again, challenges, you know, you asked like some of the things that we, we've encountered on the journey and we want to align with other companies, but people aren't going to come to our website to buy a $250 bulletproof backpack for their kid. Right. You know, so we're we're right. trying to figure, you know, and these are things that we like and and all that. So uh, we're still working on that. But, yes, we do offer training. So like if you if you're listening and you own a gun store and you want to be a dealer, we offer dealer packs. If you want to be a distributor, we have programs set up for that. Um, if you if you are a police department or you're in law enforcement, our product is an NTOA, National Tactical Officers and Associated association tested and recommended product um so we do we we are in that that arena as well we have um uh like i said we have the dealer packs uh we offer training we do demos and we travel to train i am in eastern north carolina 
So we do, I do obviously a lot of my training south of Wilmington, but we do travel across the United States to put on training. If you're a department or a unit and you purchase grips and you want some training or some training to trainer so you can teach your, your, you know, your, your police officers, soldiers, sailors and Marines, uh, we, we can do that as well. Um, and uh, we, we actually enjoy that. I, I, I prefer I really love teaching law enforcement just because uh, it's so desperately needing uh, right. for them. I, I, I know exactly uh, what you're saying, and I, I agree with you uh, you there. Can say that that's for awesome. Another podcast, but <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. I, you know, when I first got out, you, you remember, like I, I was doing uh, instruction myself, and I, yep. I'll tell you, and it's not their fault. It's they don't no. between the time, uh, the allocation of what they receive, and you're right, definitely another podcast. But I'm glad you're out there assisting where you can, providing them, you know, quality instruction. Uh, not just the Velcro commando stuff that sometimes these people get and just blows my mind that it gets past that. Um, yeah, Ron, just a lot of great stuff here, man. Really appreciate you sharing this. Um, so, you know, far as, uh, you know, how we can reach you, what's, what's the best way to, to reach you? So, um, RikerUSA.com is the website. Uh, Riker USA is our Instagram and I believe that's our Twitter and our Facebook as well. Uh, I post everything on Instagram and attach it to Twitter and uh, Facebook. Uh, I'm not a very good Twitter dude because that would make so. Um, <laughs> yeah, so let me let's clear this up. So uh, Riker is spelled R Y K E R. If you Google that, you'll find Riker uh, uh, the Riker Grip Riker USA. Um, you'll also probably see Instructor One in there somewhere. That's Ron Holmes uh, who we're talking to right now. But that name, man, where did that come from, man? Riker. <laughs> so we, so this is, I, I mentioned that my two partners are, are sailors and, um, I'm sorry, I'm, man. Marine, I'm sorry. I'm the Marine on the team. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of dip jokes and they're usually bad and they're usually from them. So it's, there's always like that, that Navy Marine Corps rivalry that goes on. Right. On. And, um, so when we first started, when we were in this whole process before we even knew we could could go further when we're in the patent writing process and the patent application process, uh, which is the, uh, another podcast. Um, but uh, we, our company was called Shipmate. And for the listeners that um, that weren't in the military or weren't in the Navy or the Marine Corps, uh, Shipmate is what you call someone who you were on a float with, but it's also kind of a derogatory term. Uh, it, it's, it's <laughs> right on. Similar. <laughs> so we thought it was hilarious to call our company shipmate and when we progressed forward into uh, um we we moved on from an llc to a c corp we couldn't use the same name we had to change everything right so at this time my son had been born and we were coming trying to come up with names and 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 i'll be honest none of them were good None of them were good because we all just really loved Shipmate and we thought it was hilarious and and we wanted humor with it. And but um, my partners called me up one day. We, we had a we had like a, a team meeting and they're like, hey, we, we got a name for the company. And I'm like, what? And they're like, we because we vote on everything. And this is the one, one the first thing that we did not all three vote on. They're like uh, Josh and I. Jake was like, Josh and I made a decision. We're calling the company Riker USA. And they were like, this is your idea. That's your son. This is how we're going to, we're going to, you know, take this forward. So my son's name is Riker and my partners made a decision to call the company Riker and we named it the Riker grip. So that that's is where awesome. I came from. Yeah, that's great. Well, Hey Ron, really appreciate your time. And, and folks, uh, Ron went down a whole list, but you know, if you're a hunting club, if you host three gun competition, um, whatever it may be, and you feel that this is something beneficial for, uh, your activity, your groups, your organizations, reach out. We're going to have inf all the information in the show notes as well, but Ron, Ron Holmes, instructor one. Thank you so much, brother. I love you. I'm so glad you came on. We'll definitely have you on again, brother. All right. Awesome. Love you, bro. Thank you. Go farther. Do more. Challenge yourself. Dig in. Winch out. Rediscover the fun of off-roading.
All with the confidence that you can do more than ever before. Because you're backed by reliable Warren products. Led by an exciting wave of new Warren products, the off-road world has never been more energized. Consider the ground up, redesigned, and never say can't attitude of the new Axon and VRX Power Sports winches. The most innovative, revolutionary winches on the market. Plus the expansive line of Warren products for the truck, commercial, utility, industrial, and severe duty markets. You give us your trust, we deliver the performance. Wherever you go, be prepared. Go Warn. The Cup of Joe segment is brought to you by C-State Coffee. Have you ever actually drank good coffee? Stop wasting your money on old, stale coffee from the store and make the switch to C-State Coffee. C-State Coffee is a United States Marine Corps veteran-owned and operated roastery, selling premium coffee that's roasted on order and delivered fresh to you. Order your coffee today at www.cstakecoffee.com. Hey, Chuck, I mean, I probably said it like 10 times this show, but gosh, it's so good to have you back. And uh, man, that was a great interview with Ron Holmes of Riker USA. Yeah, dude, the the interview was perfect, I think, for the first First on target target segment, it kind of lets the world know what they can expect coming out of it. I'm really looking forward to talking to Ron myself when we have him back on, meeting him. He's obviously a really smart guy, saw a problem, was able to determine a real-world solution, and it's obviously super applicable across all, all users, not just military, not just security, but all gun users can like utilize this product. He's seemed like a really cool dude, man. Yeah, it was great. And I, you know what? I never even, even so I, I, uh, Ron and I spoke about this when he first brought it out. We're at Shot Show. We talked about it. He breaks out this, like, God, it looked like, you know what it looked like? It looked like a, uh, like a, uh, what I want to look for, petrified soap, uh, thing. And it was kind of <laughs> like the first, like, grip that he was kind of like, hey, this is what it's going to kind of look like. Uh, and I was like, wow. But I got the concept we talked about. It, and I was like, this is super cool. But when he mentioned the whole power tool thing, with that one bioengineer, or he said, you're mm-hmm. in the wrong market. I thought that was pretty cool, too, because I didn't even think about it. It's like, good gosh, you know, you kind of right. So a lot of applications with that. Um, super cool. It was really good to talk to him. And I think we did a pretty good job staying on, you know, focus on to what we we're discussing for the interview. Because believe me, Ron and I get together, man. It, Oh, my gosh. Like I said, we're so <laughs> glad we just stuck yeah. to... <laughs> <laughs> what we're supposed oh, to instead of drifting, man. man. It was really good. And we'll definitely have him back. He's going to, hey, y'all, he's going to have to be doing segments for us too. So look forward to that. You know, I also spoke to Adam of Atlas 46 this week, and he's looking forward to putting out some new products. They've been real busy putting a lot of their things out. They are a very small company. You see all that stuff. I mean, they make it as it gets ordered. So it may not be the, if they don't have it on in stock, it may be like a week or two before you get it because they're making this stuff. But I tell you what, it's worth the wait, y'all. But if you're looking at getting some stuff for Christmas, I order it now and get it in, get it into the pile so they can do it. What you got any plans going on coming up there, Chuck? You got any hunts coming on? Well, actually, I've got a uh, GSO getting started outdoors event this Saturday, which I mentioned on episode two or three talking about this this program that the Resource Commission puts on. Right. And we're going to be taking out. Uh, mm, Due to some cancellations, I believe the final number is nine new hunters uh, coming up this weekend. So uh, looking forward to that. We're hunting a local farm, so hopefully there's a lot of success going on. That's great. I was actually today looking at some of the um, – oh gosh, when I, I'm, I'm just losing my mind tonight. You know, it's the different uh, – areas that the north carolina wildlife commission uh, kind of looks at you pay like eight bucks and you can go hunt on there uh, what am i shooting for here they're like permanent only areas right yeah yeah and oh yeah there's one up in and i'm probably saying the county wrong like everdale emmerdale something like that in that area mm-hmm. and the great thing about this and i probably shouldn't say it because then everybody's want to go there but I- i'm cool with that uh you but you go ahead and you can hunt any sex deer in that area you pay eight dollars but on top of that in that in and it's in your permit so i'm not i looked at it today like three times while you're in there hunting for your deer if you come across a coyote or a pig you can take and you can take as many as you see that day in that area i was like holy cow that's probably one of the best eight bucks you could spend uh to go hunt so and on top of it you can use light assistance at night and you can hunt from i think sun up 
all the way to 1159 at night. So well, man, see, that's, I'm glad you kind of brought up the, those, those permit only like draw hunts there. And essentially what they are, there's across the state of North Carolina, uh, the resource commission offers these lottery opportunities essentially to where you get to hunt small tracts of land for, I mean, various reasons they run lotteries, whether it's small, low deer densities, it's being managed, uh, heavily for healthy populations and whatnot. But this isn't unique to North Carolina. All states offer these lottery opportunities. But I always recommend these opportunities to either new hunters just purely because there's less pressure. There are less folks right. in the woods. So you have a better opportunity. At least in theory, you have a better opportunity, which you usually do. Or folks that are kind of skittish about traditional game lands. When you put in for these permit hunts and you get drawn for them, it's more of a, a hunt club like numbers game that people are used to. So I find that folks are a lot more at ease to go out and on our public lands than these draw opportunities because it's not one of those deals to where everybody can go. You know there's a set number of folks that could be out there. So your right. maximum number is 25. Let's say 75% of those show up. So you got like 18 people out on a few acres or a few hundred acres. Right. So yeah, they're, they're good. I can't, I can't emphasize enough for people to, especially folks that are looking to get into it. Oh, I don't have any land, that type of deal. Right. You can consolidate your efforts on those hunts and you know, well, I'm going to hunt this track of land. I'm going to scout the heck out of it. So. Right. And I already got the youth day Turkey one here in the Sand Hills, North Carolina for my son and I, I already got that one for next year. So I think it's like April, you pick the days that you want to go. And so I got that knocked out. And then I'm going to probably check out Suggs Mill later in January. For I mean, for eight bucks, I don't mind paint. Like, I absolutely do not mind investing in that area. And you're right. They're, they're not necessarily big tracts of land and stuff, but that's okay. Like, I think it's like 134 acres for one of the properties I looked at. So not necessarily like this tremendously large, but it's pretty big. 100 acres is a lot of ground still. And there's a lot of oh. water, a lot of vegetation there, uh, definitely some food areas. So there's great opportunities and you're right, you know, it's perfect for me getting back into hunting, working on things I need to work on and stuff. And again, the pressures of it. Yeah. It, it, I'm really happy. I, I found that. And I'm, I just really got to thank my other friend, Brian, his name's Brian, who brought it to my attention. He says, yeah, yeah, check this out. Yeah. Definitely going to do that. Yeah. Well, and, and you're going to experience something totally different than what you and I experienced when we turkey hunted you are. Right. I mean, cause we, we, we were bumping into other hunters. Right. And we were seeing people out hiking and stuff, which is something I don't care about. I don't mind it at all. It's it's public land. Come out and enjoy it how you want to. But when you're out trying to learn, it just removes some of those other, I guess, um, factors that can right. impact your successes. So it's great, man. And that's awesome. I'm looking forward to hearing about that one. Yeah, we, we need to go, uh, you know, uh, vindicate ourselves on uh, your <laughs> This next turkey scene. Just saying, Chuck. We need to do that. Oh man, I'm 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 still <laughs> dialed in on the deer, but I'm I'm hearing gobbles. That was a good spot future. though. I think that spot we we're at was pretty darn good. Like that one field, I think it was perfect, man. But and well, then we saw and, that doe, which obviously we were out of season. I was like, oh my goodness, right. that couldn't have been any better of a shot. She all, she almost ran us over. <laughs> but you know, and I actually don't think you and I had ever talked about it. No, but, no. So the bird. We heard a bird gobble, one gobble, tried to get on it unsuccessfully, sat down, saw the doe. Well, when we walked up the hill, you know, we had gotten on a trail uh, as we had got to the top of the hill. It was, a, it was a, a maintained hiking trail. Well, actually, the two guy, two other guys that I was camping with that weekend had circled around us, and apparently we had just passed each other because we compared maps after the fact. Right. But um, they had actually got on that bird and hunted that bird all morning. And we're never successful on it either. So the bird was there. They heard it gobbling all morning long, but it was just totally non-responsive. So moving on was the right move on our part, for sure. Those things are so smart, though, man. They just are. Oh, I know. People I know. You're such a little it. pea brain. Yeah, right? Yeah, For so for this weekend, I, I got what I mentioned a couple shows ago. I got that Toys for Tots event with right. uh, Carolina Jeepsters. It's uh, in Fayetteville, Carolina Ale House. True Page is going to be there. Mission 22 is going to be there. And I, th I want to say it's like from 10 to 2 at Carolina Ale House in Fayetteville. That would be really cool. I already know that I think your Carolina Jeepsters, I think Infidel Jeepsters is going to be there. 
I think there's like a motorcycle club who's doing like a toy delivery coming. So it's going to be pretty big. And I know some car clubs are thinking about being going to be there. So it's not just for Jeeps and all that. It's for the community. Hey, come out, do some great things and, you know, help some kids in need to have a pretty good Christmas and, and, and feel the love. Yes, sir. That sounds like a good, good time. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Hey, you know what? Uh, before I forget, you know, that might be something good later that we talk about too, Chuck, is uh, that map program you were showing me. And obviously, I know there's a couple out there, but uh, it might be a really good thing to discuss too so people understand the benefits of those and not just wandering around. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there, there, there are tons of them offered. The one I use, though, uh, you're probably referring to is OnX. Right. Where they provide the traditional GPS mapping with topo and aerial photos. But what they've done is they've put together a nationwide system and, and you have to pay to play with them. So you, it's, it's a hundred dollars a year. You get all 50 States or it's $30 for one state. But anyway, it's overlaid with all of the property boundaries. So right. it's like last Saturday I was up at South mountain doing a little bit of hunting and South mountain has, which is, pretty common across the state with these game lands. There's blocks of private within these game lands. Don't cross the line. And they're usually marked, but when they're not, it's your responsibility to know where you are. Right. So that's, that's one of the huge benefits of it. But I'm telling you between that and Google earth, man, there's a, there's a lot of deer that get killed with computers. Right. Just through right. Scout with that stuff. So. I actually use that. After you showed me that I downloaded it and I use that and you're right. Cause I was the, one of the properties I hunted. If I didn't have that, I could have easily, easily drifted into another property, not even known. And you know, been right. in the wrong if I would have saw a rack right there. Yeah, it's a great program. Right. Keeps you in check. Oh yeah. And you can share waypoints. So even if you're not like using it for necessarily hunting, but say you had somewhere that you were down some road that you don't have an address for, you can just share the location with me. No problem. Boom. Right. I, and I can go right to it or at least get pretty doggone close. So no, they're cool. Super beneficial tool. Yeah. Well, Hey man, glad to have you back. Look forward to talking some more next week. Hey y'all. Thanks again for joining us this week. Make sure to subscribe to the show and maybe even leave us a five-star rating. Thanks for listening to the route one, six grind. We want to thank our amazing sponsors, Warren Industries, Tuffy Security Products, Sea State Coffee, and Route 16 Off-Road for their support. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and more. Just look for Route 16, that's R-O-O-T-O-N-E-S-I-X, or just go to Route16.com. Until next week, plan smart, be safe, and as always, be prepared. I know what I'm using for bait next time. Fish on! Yeah!